Michel Foucault was one of Europe's most influential thinkers since the Second World War. Is that a fair statement? I would agree with it, yeah. I think his ideas are very difficult to ignore. Even if you disagree with them, okay. they're difficult to ignore. And so why is he mentioned so much in academic literature? Well, Foucauldian ideas have challenged the way we look at a lot of things. For example, um, mental illness, justice, sexuality, social deviance, the way society exercises power over the individual, the way language shapes our thinking. He had a lot to say about a lot of things in a relatively short academic career, very intense academic career. This is why he's mentioned so often, I think. Okay, so can you start by telling us about his life? He, he was born in a provincial French city in 1926 into a Catholic family, conservative Catholic family. His father was a medical doctor. Um, at the age of, or in his teens, he rebelled against his family's conservative Catholicism and abandoned religion. This would have been during World War II, actually, when France was occupied. Then he was able to enter one of the top universities in Paris. Um, and after he graduated, he led a kind of semi-nomadic life. He did research and had some teaching jobs in several European countries. I think Poland was one, mm. and Sweden, one or two others, perhaps, and also North Africa as mm. well. Mm. Then later he came back to do a PhD, and his PhD research was in the field of the, the philosophy of psychology, which is about as specialised as you can get. That sounds fun to me. Yeah, it was. And the result of that was a book. His, his thesis was a, later published in book form with the title Madness and Civilization. Mm. This is in the 19, early 1960s, I think. That book attracted a lot of attention because of the controversy it created, mm. some, some of his radical ideas. And after that, he was on the map, you might say, the academic map in Europe, and he became a full-time academic researcher from then on. But his life was cut short when he died at the age of 57 mm -hmm. because of the HIV virus. Right. He was one of the early victims. Yeah, he was. Can you do a little bit more intellectual background? Like, who influenced him? Yeah, yeah. Um, there are some interesting stories which have come out from his university days, which would have been uh, late 40s, early 50s. He seems to have been fascinated by the Marquis de Sade. And if the stories are true, mm -hmm. Foucault tried to model his life or his behaviour on the Marquis de Sade. I don't know where that led, but with the mainstream philosophers who in influenced him at a young age, as an undergraduate, uh, three of them stand out, and they're all German. Mm. That's a trend. Yeah, just like Derrida. <laughs> yeah. uh, Hegel, Kant and Nietzsche. Hegel, Hegel, Hegel's ideas on the role of history and human thought profoundly influenced uh, Foucault's thinking about knowledge. Mm -hmm. right. Secondly, Kant, Immanuel Kant, was a very mm -hmm. strong influence. Kant, you may remember, suggested that we abandon the old question, why is the world the way it is, and replace it with a different question, why do we see the world the way it is? Mm -hmm. And when young Foucault encountered this, this was a big revelation to him, and this question formed the starting point for many of his later research projects. And the third one was the German philosopher we discussed in, a, in another discussion, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche had very interesting, or at least to Foucault, very fascinating ideas about the relationship between power and knowledge. Yeah. It's funny you cannot escape Hegel, no matter what <laughs> he pops up. So we could explore so many routes, but can you, you know, give him just a couple of the main ideas? Okay. He, uh, he was fascinated by a term he used which is discourse. And to simplify it, discourse is the way we look at the world, the way we think about the world, and the way we talk about the world. And for Foucault, discourse was formed by largely unconscious rules, unconscious rules, uh, which shape the way we think. We accept these rules as they are handed down to us as just normal, natural, simple common sense. Mm. But for Foucault, the important point is that these rules are the products of whatever historical conditions apply at the time. And as historical conditions change, the rules change. So discourse changes. So that means, according to Foucault, we should be able to track how ideas, institutions, 
ways of thinking, which are all under the umbrella of discourse, have evolved, taken shape, arisen and died out and changed along the way. This is the Foucauldian concept of the archaeology of knowledge. Now, he could, he, we, could use different, we could use different examples to illustrate this. For example, one concept of man is very interesting. So, this is kind of new for me. I've, I've heard some of these terms, but can we just pick up the Foucauldian discourse? Because, I don't know, does that, is that synonymous with worldview? Uh, it, it can be, but um, if we... Well, I'll give you a little example, or a few examples. Right? When we talk about man as a concept, we, well, now we would call it humanity or human yeah, race or something yeah. like that. You know, Foucault was writing in French, sure. and uh, the translations were done in the 60s and 70s, so they reflect pre-political correctness right. terminology. But he, man was viewed very, very differently from the past, in the past compared to now. Um, the way we see man is, is very different. And this is because the, our discourse is different. Now, what is discourse? I'll try to simplify it if I can. As history develops, institutions emerge in society. And these institutions exert a great deal of power over how we think about the world, how we see the world, how we see each other, how we talk about the world. And these institutions for Foucault are large, abstract things, governments, religions, science, uh, economic institutions, healthcare systems, legal systems, education. And they shape the way we think. <coughs> Sorry. Ah, oh, bless you. They shape the way we think. And what happens is, in the Foucauldian con uh, conception, these abstract ideas, mental realities, he may call them, are handed down to us from above. And what we do is we accept them without challenge. And by accepting them without challenge, we give them legitimacy. And we finally give them authority over us. We allow them to dictate how we think mm -hmm. and how we see the world, how we see each other, how we judge behavior, etc. So these ideas are given to us from above and they're supported by us from below. So it becomes a two-way yeah, process. Right. I guess that's... Now imagine you and I were having a discussion about the best way to prevent floods. Would it make sense for us to talk about the best way to pray to the rain god? I suppose not. No, because the, the discourse by which we lead our lives, the scientifically dominated discourse of the 21st century, the mental reality that shapes us, has no place for a spirit in the sky yeah. who controls the rain and who make it angry and cause floods. But what about if we weren't sitting here in this office now in the 21st century? What about if we were hunter-gatherers living thousands of years ago and we were talking about ways to prevent floods? In that case, it would make perfect sense. It would be perfectly reasonable for us to talk about the best way to pray to the rain god mm -hmm. because the mental reality surrounding us, our discourse as hunter-gatherers living thousands of years ago, certainly has a place for a spirit in the sky, who controls the rain and you make it angry if we don't pray to him and cause a flood. Right? But let's take this one step further. As hunter-gatherers living thousands of years ago, would we be able to talk about uh, an invisible force in the sky which controls the way the moon and the planets and the stars move around the sky? Now, as men in the 21st century, we, we definitely know that this invisible force exists. We even have a name for gravity, yeah. yeah. But as hunter-gatherers living thousands <coughs> of years ago, our discourse would have nothing to say about gravity. That would mean gravity would be a meaningless concept, so we couldn't even think about it. Yes, I remember learning about this in medieval church history, that the church did things for you and that became real, mm -hmm. and it worked. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there are implications involved here. One is that, um, the, or the main one I think which comes out of Foucauldian thinking is the way we see man, mm -hmm. oh, you have to use the word man, this is the word he used, the way we see man now is radically different from how it was in 
past century. Yeah. The way philosophers, men of knowledge, saw man is very different back then to how we see it. Now that's important in itself, but Foucault goes on to make a fascinating point. He argues that not only is our conception of man radically different from how it was hundreds of years ago, but it's become paradoxical. And the paradox is this. We see ourselves as objects in the world, which means we are legitimate targets of study. Mm -hmm. But we are today, today. Today we see yes, ourselves right. as yeah. yeah. So we are objects in the world and so we, we are targets of study just like anything else in the world. But it's we ourselves who are the subjects who con who conduct the study. So it's, it's the paradox is that we're looking in two directions at the same time. Subject and object. Yeah. I'm sorry because I always have trouble with subject object, object, object because yeah, I don't yeah. always follow this to yeah. be at the same time because I thought it's more like we we are constantly switching like like as I'm interviewing you you are the object of the interview or or sorry wait a minute I guess you'd be this mm. are you there? you're the subject of the interview and Foucauldian ideas of object like, uh, I always get this confused well like, let, let's explain it this way when you when you interview me as you are now. You are the subject, which is the researcher, okay. the seeker of information. I am the object. Because I'm, I'm kind of using you. Yeah, I'm the object, the source, the, the researchee, okay. the source of the information. Okay. So researcher, researchee, seeker, giver, uh, subject, object. But let's imagine a somewhat artificial scenario where I'm interviewing myself about some topic. I would still be the subject, the seeker of information. I would still be the object, the giver of information. Okay. But what about if I interviewed myself uh -huh. about myself? Uh -huh. I would still be the subject. Yeah. I would still be the object. But the big question which arises is, how do I know that I can be objective? I mean, is it possible for me to step outside myself and look at myself objectively and mm -hmm. study myself mm -hmm. objectively? Mm -hmm. I think the answer has to be no. No one can do that. Right? Now, if we apply this as widely as possible, we humans study humanity, or as, as, as Foucault would say, man studies man. So, how do we know that we can be objective? I mean, right. It's become well, very complex now. Yeah. See, hundreds of years ago, it was all very simple. We were the products of creation, and our place in the world, and our place in the universe was very clear and very simple. But since then, thanks to people like Copernicus, okay. Galileo, and and Great minds like Charles Darwin and yeah. uh, Sigmund Freud, Karl Marx, people like that. The discourse about what it means to be human is radically different now. So we see ourselves very differently and we don't know if we, we can be objective or not mm -hmm. about ourselves. It's all become much more complex now, I think. Try to imagine this. Try to imagine that you are... Uh, th there is a, a theatrical performance on the stage, and you are both the actor and the audience. Mm, and mm, try to get your head around mm, that. Mm, mm. This is the subject-object parallel. And this is a new way to think. That yeah. That people didn't used to yeah. deal with this. Because we are objects in the world. We are produced by the world. We are not masters of the world. We are, we, we've arisen from the world, so we are legitimate objects yeah. of study. But at the same time, we're subjects who conduct the study. So there's a inherent paradox in this. Okay, so people, yeah, okay, that's mm -hmm. good, that's good. Uh, I think then, would this relate to Foucault's uh, archaeology of ideas? Yeah, yes. um, the, 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 the archaeology of ideas is an interesting thing. I mean, at the surface level, the everyday level, it doesn't have to change the way you live or anything, but as a basic principle about how you view the world, it can be very useful. For example, if you realise that the the discourse by which you and I lead our lives is neither inevitable nor permanent. It's open to change. It will change. The times in which we live will one day become ancient history. Mm -hmm. So the lesson there that we can draw from that is, well, Foucault would say it's a, it's a good idea not to let yourself become a slave to the times in which you live. Good. I like that. Mm. I like that. Let's, let's go on to the mental health, because I know he's really mm. famous for that. Mm. Um, what can you tell us about what he had to say okay. about mental health? 
his uh, PhD work, you remember, was in the highly specialised field of the philosophy <coughs> of psychology. And in that work, he challenged a lot of the basic ideas that we have about mental health and its treatment. So, sorry, philosophy of psychology? Philosophy of psychology. Um, as far as I'm as far as I know, he's the only one I've ever heard this. It sounds so funny. Yeah, 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 I know. Anyway, um, I, I guess one way to talk about this is if you were to get a random sample of people now and ask them a simple question, ask them, do you think that the treatment that mentally ill people got hundreds of years ago was better or worse than the treatment mentally ill people get now? I'm yeah. not sure. I would assume it was worse. Everybody, I'm sure every, most people, everybody would say, it was worse back then, it's better now. I mean, we all take for granted that hundreds of years ago, mentally ill people were locked up, they were ridiculed, they yeah. were tortured, yeah, that's marginalised. Like, experiment, human mm -hmm, experimentation. Mm -hmm. And they were laughed at, mocked and rejected by society. But Foucault's argument, based on his research, turns this upside down. He says that the image is completely wrong. Mm -hmm. And he presents a lot of evidence for this in the book Madness and Civilization, which arose out of his PhD research. For Foucault, the way we deal with mental illness now, which is to treat it as a medical problem, has actually created more problems than it's solved. Uh, I could talk at great length about this, but uh, it's quite depressing actually. But in a nutshell, Foucault argues that the more we care, the less we cure. And the more we intervene, mm -hmm. the more we oppress. Let, let's go to the other project, uh, Crime and Punishment. Ah, yes. Yeah, yeah. He's also the got Social Deviance. Yes, yeah. Right, yeah. He, he wrote a book which became quite popular. It may even have been a bestseller. Um, I know it was translated into many languages. It was published in 1975 under the title, English title, uh, Discipline and Punish. Mm. And in that book, he researched how criminal justice systems and our attitudes towards criminal justice and social deviance have evolved over the centuries. He makes the point quite strongly that criminal justice has developed not so much to deal with criminal justice or criminality, but more as an instrument by which society exerts control, power over the individual. Right. And he, he, he says that if you think about it, criminal justice doesn't really deal with the guilty. It's more concerned with the potentially guilty, you and me. So, <coughs> that, so that's, that's, that's how he, he deals with that. And then in a later book, he, he wrote a three-volume uh, book called The History of Sexuality. He deals with, mm. he expands from social deviance to sexual deviance. And one point which comes out very strongly in that three-volume book is that if a society labels one form of sexual <coughs> expression as normal... I, I'm sorry, uh, what kind of expression? If, if sexual yeah, expression. Sexual expression. If, if it labels one form of sexual expression as normal, then it must label other forms of sexual expression as abnormal. We can see now even in our own time that this attitude has given rise to a lot of controversy and debate in political and social religious circles around the world. But there's another point to be made here too, I think. For Foucault, knowledge, with a capital K, mm. what we know to be normal, what we know to be natural, is in many ways dictated by the institutions in our society which shape the way we think. Institutions like government, science, religion, legal systems. They influence the way we see the world, the way we see each other, the way we judge behaviour. And this brings us back to the concept of discourse mm -hmm. that we discussed yeah. earlier. So when you say we, are you saying that Everybody, even if you are rich and powerful, even if you are, say, controlling the government, are you still, do you still have to be under the control of these, of the discourse? Well, for Foucault, the control is mental and unconscious. It's not physical at all. Um, as long as you are, you, you meaning anybody, as long as you are a member of society, you will be under some sort mm. of state control, whether you realize it or not. And a simple example of this, a very basic example, is when you buy something, Every time you buy something, you have to pay, of course. What do you pay with? Mm -hmm. You pay with an instrument which is issued by the state, 
and controlled by the state. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing for Foucault is nobody questions this. Everybody simply accepts it. There's your control for you. Mm -hmm. the, control, the best control is the one where you don't even know you're being controlled. Okay, uh, so let's wrap up. But yeah, Foucault sounds at the same time radical and maybe subversive, yet he's popular, right? So if I understand right, can you kind of wrap up by saying, by talking about his status in the academic world? The people who admire him, and he, he does have a great many admirers, are quick to point out that he exercised great intellectual independence. I think even his enemies would agree with that statement. But they also praise his intellectual courage in the way that he tried to break down academic boundaries mm -hmm. by writing about sexuality and justice and morality and power, language, things like that. He, he tried to break down academic boundaries, which is quite admirable. Uh, his enemies, his, his critics, on the other hand, were quick to point out that, uh, in their words, he was intellectually dishonest. They accused him of uh, loose and sloppy and uh, incomplete, inaccurate research. Mm. And they said that he often exaggerated. But uh, I guess whichever side you may take in this, that there are two things which I think everyone would agree, whether they support him or whether they criticize him. One is that um, he spent his entire academic life thinking about thinking, which is rather unusual, you know, thinking about thinking. That's, that's like, like the history of thinking yeah, and, and how to think. Yeah. And the second thing uh, which stands out is that all throughout his academic career, whatever he was researching, he always kept sight of, on one basic question which he always remembered and which kind of formed a foundation for all of his research. That question was, what does it mean to be human? Yep. And that, I think, is All right. I like it. Right. I'm going to look into here. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks.